kind introduction. Um, you know, I really do appreciate everyone taking the time out of, out of their schedules. I know this is a very, very uh, surreal time to be in, uh, but uh, sharing education and peer-to-peer -peer evaluations and, uh, and discussions uh, is really uh, the, the cornerstone of, of what education is about. Uh, doing it through a virtual uh, aspect is something that we've come to, to know of recent and hopefully uh, this can be a benefit to all those that have given their time up tonight. Um, so thank you for the introduction as well, Margie, about my background. I will go through a little bit of that in the first few slides of this talk, but today we're gonna to talk about uh, treatment of hip OA. And really what that means is unloading the painful hip with the help of an unloader uh, brace that has been designed and developed by OSER. Um, you know, I'm not a consultant for OSER. I wanna put that out there first and foremost. I just believe in their products. And so I think this uh, the peer to peer uh, kind of discussions that we have are very fruitful for me. I learn every time I have these discussions with my peers, uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's really the mainstay of education uh, henceforth. Um, so to begin the talk, we're gonna start today with uh, discussing why OSER really has uh, become uh, the cornerstone of prosthetics and bracing in our environment. Uh, based out of Iceland, you know, really as a prosthetic company, they really take pride in, in looking at patients' problems and providing them opportunities to live without limitations. Um, I've gotten to know them firsthand through the bracing aspects, but really learning about the company has really taught me a lot about th their drive and really uh, their, their motivation for helping patients uh, throughout, whether it be sports-related activities or activities of daily living. Um, a little bit about our institute, as, as Margie briefly mentioned previously, uh, my mentor and colleague, Dr. Benjamin Dome, and I uh, have uh, recently developed an institute here in Chicago, but it's not a new a new practice. This has been around uh, for 10 years. Uh, we have developed a research foundation uh, coexistent with our clinical practice. Uh, we're just at a new facility now here in Chicago, and I encourage each and every one of you, if you have a chance, uh, we're about a stone's throw from Chicago Airs Airport, about two and a half miles to be exact. Uh, come by, stop by for a cup of coffee. love to chat about hip-related pathology or anything uh, that you may have. Um, we are the top center in the country by volume for hip arthroscopy. Uh, we have the largest hip preservation research database worldwide. Uh, we are consultants for major pro teams in North America. Uh, we also, outside of hip preservation, we're an all-encompassing hip uh, treatment team. So we perform outpatient and inpatient robotic hip replacements, uh, direct anterior and posterior hip resurfacing, commonly known as the Birmingham hip resurfacing. We also perform cutting edge regenerative medicine techniques like stem cells and PRP. Uh, Margie had mentioned a little bit about uh, my background in athletics, and I would be remiss to proceed on without uh, mentioning that it, it has played a big role in the caveats about my perspective. Um, I've been a patient. I've had fractured collarbones. I've had an ACL reconstruction. I've had a dislocated ankle. I've had a broken finger. So I've had, you know, multiple uh, injuries that have put me on the other side of the, of, the, of the tape. And I understand what it means to go through the rehab process. And when I encourage my patients, both preoperatively and postoperatively, um, it really does play a role into how I perceive their outcomes. Um, my clinical training, as Margie mentioned, uh, really is paralleled with my mentor and partner. Uh, after completing our, our undergraduate and medical degrees, as well as our orthopedic surgery residency, we both went on to perform sports medicine fellowship training at our respective centers, Dr. Dome at uh, Kirtland Job, myself down in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and when, when Ben came out of his training, he sought to, to find further training in the hip preservation field but it didn't exist. Uh, there was no formal fellowship at that time. Uh, he went to various uh, regions of the earth looking after uh, colleagues that were looking at sort of hip pathology as he was thinking about it for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. Uh, went to Switzerland to burn uh, with, with Reinhold Gantz's team and it came back to the, to the States and found particular centers in and around North America that were attempting hip preservation procedures. Fortunately, uh, when I was, was ready to, to dive into this field, I sought after really the premier fellowship program in the country with, with, with uh, Ben and I've stayed on ever since and it's really been a, a fantastic experience. Um, again, down, some, down into to the Southeast Conference, uh, meeting with, with Dr. Andrews, Dr. Kane, Dr. Dugas, Dr. Emblem, great mentors, uh, got to take care of some, some fantastic athletes. Uh, just a list of athletes here that uh, you see from Dr. Andrews' side, uh, the WWE wrestlers were my particular favorite, uh, you know, these athletes are really phenoms. Uh, they get injured just like any other professional athlete. They, they get surgery just like everybody else and they rehab just like the professional athletes do. And so 
what they do is really fun to watch because uh, as opposed to a pro athlete who wants to come in through the back door through the VIP entrance, these folks want to come right through the front door with a camera crew. And so they're asking for us to uh, be on Facebook Live during their during their consultations. It's a really fun experience, actually. Um, this here's a little map just about our uh, colleagues that exist from the ASMI uh, training program. And it's really a great Rolodex of, 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 of uh, colleagues to talk to about professional athletes in any sport, um, whether it be football, baseball, uh, golf, tennis, what have you. Uh, it's really great to have a uh, really uh, pathway that we all trained with uh, out of Birmingham. We got to meet great great colleagues and great mentors as well. So uh, Coach Saban here from Alabama, you know, was really someone to, to look out and see how he's he's perfected his craft and taken his team to national championships. I actually got to see him as a patient. Uh, he underwent hip replacement surgery uh, last year and is doing phenomenally well. So uh, it's really just, it, it goes through and through from from, from athletics uh, through, through everyday activities. Uh, it's really fun to watch. And colleagues stay together. So we've got a great mentorship model and we, we continue to see each other at, at, at frequent meetings. And it's been a really fun experience. Um, so let's get started on today's talk and why we're really here. Um, you know, it's about innovation. And I think OSER is a big part of that when it comes to prosthetics and bracing. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, he's got a Tesla Roadster uh, shooting around our solar system at the moment. He's created these rockets that are returnable to Earth. Uh, so He's also got a, a very, very unique perspective on the next hundred years of, of human evolution. And I think, uh, you know, I would be remiss again once to say if, if I didn't mention his, his new son's name, which is if anyone can pronounce that, please email me. Um, but he's very innovative in the way he thinks about personal and, and uh, uh, business life. And I think that uh, it's, it's about this type of innovation that, that really has kept me thinking about the next level in orthopedics is the hip and athletic joint. And so that's the question that, that we sort of have to ask ourselves on a daily basis, but of course it is. You, you know, we see athletes in our clinic that work on their core, work on their hip, the dynamic stabilizers to perform these type of activities, these front flips and these dynamic motions. Um, these are paramount to their success. Um, do injuries occur? Of course they do. Um, so this is Bo Jackson in the upper right. Uh, we all may or may not know the story of how he had a dislocation, relocation moment uh, during an NFL football game. He went on to, to succumb to avascular necrosis, needing a, a, a total hip replacement uh, at that time. Now, you fast forward uh, a few decades and you see Aaron A-Rod from the Yankees who underwent bilateral hip arthroscopies. This is hip preservation now. It's a different time period, different concept. And so we've got things to learn. We're going to go about some of that learning process through this talk. Now, hip replacements at that time, we tried to go back to playing sports, and Bo Jackson did, uh, but albeit for a very short time. He currently is on his uh, third uh, total hip replacement, unfortunately, because of the load that was put on that prosthetic implant. So workers are treated just the same. Uh, they are in and of themselves just like a professional athlete. They, they get injured, whether it be uh, accidental or, or uh, unavoidable. Um, for those of you that may have seen this particular slide on the right, this is, this is a static image. Uh, you may have to use your imagination of what could happen. So, you know, we look at the shoulder and the knee, and I'm going to kind of go through an evolution of an understanding of, of how we get to hip pain and how, how things like an unload or hip brace can help us manage our patient populations. In the shoulder, we've talked about subacromial decompression, label repair, rotator cuff repair, in the knee, we've, we've heard of ACL reconstruction for decades. Uh, cartilage replacement procedures are newer, uh, but even meniscus repair and debridement. So why not think of the hip like the shoulder? Uh, they're both ball and socket joints. Uh, they both are, are multi-axial in, in planes of motion. Um, so again, when we look at the, the anatomy of them, they should theoretically function uh, similarly. Well, they don't. Um, in the shoulder, again, we look at anatomic rotator cuff repair, but for decades in the hip, you know, any sort of pain has been traditionally diagnosed as early arthritis. And it really is a testament to the inability for the brain to localize hip pain. Um, you know, if you have a painful toe, it's very, very unequivocal that your pain is coming from your toe. Uh, but when you have a patient put their, their hand in a C-shaped fashion over the hip region and say, I think I have hip pain, that pain could be coming from anywhere inside intraarticularly, extraarticularly. It could be coming from the lower back. It could be coming from the knee. It could be coming from intra-abdominal structures. So it's really hard for the brain to localize where the pain is coming from. And because of that difficulty of diagnostics, it's really led to a delay in treatment. And so 
you know, when, now when we look at the, the thought process that you're just going to have to wait until you need hip replacement, well, patients are really not hearing that anymore. This is the kind of answer that you're, you're getting back from your patients. It's, it's because the clinician may or may not know, you know, what the, the details uh, lie ahead in that diagnostic algorithm. So we're going to go through some of that today. Um, again, looking at the shoulder, it's taught us so much about how we look at the hip. Um, you know, Charlie Near in 72 described impingement in the shoulder. Um, in 99, the, the labral tear of the hip was thought to be a watershed lesion. So just a vascular region that if it, if it got injured, it was injured. Um, in 2003, Reinhold Gans out of Bern described the term femoral acetabular impingement and it really started a movement. Um, now in the shoulder, not everything was impingement. And so it led to the discovery of other problems as we know them today. And I, and I think, I truly feel that that's where we are right now in the hip. We are looking to explain these other findings of hip pain generators. So again, looking at a Google search, uh, this is even up to 10 years ago. Um, I will say that when the term FMRS tabular impingement was put out, this is when Reinhold Gans's paper came out in 2003. And you look at the, the sort of skyrocketing of, of uh, in inquiries. And that was again, 10 years ago. So imagine what it is today, it's exponential. So when you look at hip OA in particular, um, of course, supporting non-surgical management is first line. Um, we know that physical, ed physical therapy, patient education, exercise, weight loss, pharmaceuticals uh, with PO pain medication, uh, anti-inflammatories, and injections, uh, whether they be corticosteroids or even biologics, stem cells or PRP, these are paramount to the patient prolonging the time prior to a total hip replacement. And any, I would submit to you that along this pathway, things like bracing uh, has, has an opportunity. Um, and I would also submit to you that there's a rung missing in this pyramid, and that's hip preservation. And that's the sort of practice that I find myself in because we're an all-encompassing hip care team. So I treat patients that are 14 up to 114. So a 14-year-old does not need a hip replacement, but <clears throat> they need hip preservation. They need to have a diagnostic algorithm that figures out why they have pain, how to get them out of pain, and prevent them from needing the potential eventual total hip replacement, which is the gold standard for taking care of hip pain. So we're going to go through the unloader hip in, in particular and just talk about the biomechanics behind it and what it's meant to do. Um, it's really meant to improve stability and mobility of the hip joint. It's, it's, it's designed to optimize low dispersion of the OA affected hip joint. And so how does that work? Well, Let's look at the first things first. Let's look at the knee. We've been doing this in the knee for, for, for years, and Oser is a, a great example of a company that's really put a lot of time and effort and R&D behind perfecting something like this. So if you look at that top left x-ray there, you have medial joint space narrowing, a varus uh, appearing knee. Well, with a, a medial unloading uh, knee brace, you can unload the, the worn cartilage and unload the healthy appearing cartilage. So if you look at the image on the right, with the unloader knee brace in place, you have effectively created a more neutral uh, knee alignment, thereby providing the patient with some pain relief and stability with improved proprioception. So the same principles uh, are present in, in something like a hip unloader brace. Uh, the idea being to shift the maximal load to less affected areas, meaning healthier cartilage. Again, the, the goal being provide stability and improve proprioception. So, the biomechanics behind this, it, it's, a, it's a multifaceted. So you have a pulley system that provides compression. It delivers appropriate receptive support to abductor tendons of the hip. Um, and the goal is to improve the ability to dynamically mobilize the joints, improving muscle tension. There's also a dynamic rotational strap. And so the idea behind that is providing an external rotation moment as needed, which increases the abductor moments and improve load dispersion. So during swing phase and stance phase, there are differences of activity of the, the, the brace itself. And we'll look at that right here. So if you look at the beginning of this, this gait cycle uh, during heel strike, the strap tension is high. Um, so patient is just landing. Now the tension is going to precipitously drop because they're in stance phase and the femoral head is in congruity with the acetabulum where it was meant to be with the activity of the brace. Now the tension will rise back up as the patient goes from stance to uh, a swing phase because it's trying to maintain the femoral head, again, unloading the painful cartilage regions. Um, so, you know, we, we need to look at the candidacy for this kind of uh, uh, bracing treatment then. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up these two pictures here and I want you to sort of look internally and think about 
uh, the differences in these hips. And on the top left image, we're clearly looking at the left hip because that is the one is, that, is, that appears to be arthritic with joint space narrowing compared to the right hip. Now on the right image, we're looking at the right hip. And so I wanna point out one very, very important point of the image on the top right. Um, if you look here, this patient presented to me with an effective abduction contracture. Do you see the medialization of that femoral head well toward the ischial line? The patient had an effective leg length discrepancy. He said, doctor, I think my right leg is longer than my left. It's been like that for years. His wife has put shoe lifts on his left shoe because they thought that his left leg was shorter. But what's really going on here is that the patient's deformity has prevented him from, from bringing his be leg back to neutral because the osteophytic uh, change and he's effectively feeling that he has a longer leg. This is not the patient that can be unloaded. In fact, an unloader brace would, would further compromise this patient's gait pattern. The patient on the left, however, is a perfect candidate. It's a superiorized and lateralized femoral head. So with a compression moment, an external rotation moment, and an abduction moment distally, you can thereby increase load dispersion of the hip joint from poor cartilage to healthier, healthier a cartilage that's in the joint. Now, of course, if all else fails, uh, patients will proceed on to a total hip replacement. Both patients did very well. Now, I wanna point out the bottom right image. Leg lengths are equal, offset is equal, and the patient has now restored function and gait due to the gold standard hip replacement procedure. Here's a little video of performing that procedure. This is an outpatient technique. This is a seven centimeter approach to the anterior portion of the hip. Uh, we do this in a robotic fashion, uh, robotic arm assisted, to placement of the acetabular component within the socket. You're gonna see the femoral head coming out there. And now we're gonna use the robotic arm here to perfectly place a component at the designed and desired uh, position with abduction and inclination. Here's a final uh, femoral stem component being placed and the completion of the case. Now, again, this is about a one hour procedure done in an outpatient fashion. The patient will go home uh, this evening and start physical therapy the following day. So who else is a candidate for the unloader hip? Well, I've talked to you about getting all the way through the top of the pyramid and total hip replacements, but I told you earlier that there was a rung that was missing. And I believe that there's twofold uh, sort of teaching here. First is to say that hip arthroscopy actually is, is warranted uh, for hip preservation. Then we'll talk about the specific candidates within hip arthroscopy. Um, so hip arthroscopy, what are the injuries that we treat? Well, labral tears. These are things that we commonly hear about. Uh, we talk about femoral acetabular impingement. I mentioned that previously with Reinhold Gans' original article in 2003. Two different types, cam and pincer. So pincer being overgrowth of the bone on the acetabulum and cam being overgrowth of the bone on the femoral head. And finally, intraarticular cartilage damage. So these are things that are amenable to treatment with hip arthroscopy. But first and foremost, I need to point out what the function of the labrum is. So the labrum really is a load-bearing uh, force, just like a meniscus in the knee. However, in the, in the hip, it provides a suction seal of the hip joint. Uh, it provides joint stability by regulating the fluid lubrication. There's a whole lecture in and of itself to go into this, this topic, uh, but for purposes of this peer-to-peer -peer discussion, I encourage you all to put the volume up on your computers, or at least uh, if you can, um, because I want to point out the next three clips here. Um, so the first image and video is going to be of a native, this is a gross specimen of the, of the hip joint uh, with the native labrum intact. And I want to point out the audible suction seal of the hip with, again, with the normal labrum intact. So now that you've appreciated that, I wanna point out the next video here is gonna be when the labrum is torn and you're gonna notice the absence of the seal. And the final video is gonna be with the restored labrum. So this is gonna be with our paired labrum, again, restoring the suction seal of the hip.
And so why does this matter? Because if you have a labral tear, you effectively have uh, aberrant cartilage contact, which can lead to rapid degeneration of the joint, which is why FAI or femoral tabular impingement or late and labral tears can lead to arthritic hip joints. So that's why the rung on the pyramid is missing. And that's kind of where my practice fills in this gap. Um, so looking at labral tears intraarticularly through an arthroscope, we're seeing this shredded chondrolabral junction, but a very, very robust and repairable labrum, which is right there, that, that ring that goes around the acetabulum. And so when in doubt, we wanna repair this if it's repairable. If it's irreparable, we'll talk about that a little bit later in this talk here. So when we wanna repair, we do this in a controlled tension anatomic fashion. Um, we've described this in the literature. This is again, a, a arthroscopic technique, minimally invasive fashion. These are knotless anchors. You can see the femoral head come back into position and with a restoration of that labral seal. Um, this is not an open technique anymore. This used to be a, a true hip dislocation, uh, but now this is done in an MIS fashion with arthroscopic portals and patients are going home the same day starting PT uh, the next morning. We've also published on this, identifying the most successful procedures in hip arthroscopy. Um, this is one of them. When the labrum is repairable, uh, the patient does the best with the labral repair. Again, if it's irreparable, we'll talk about that in a moment. But this repair is superior to a labral resection. So to remove a torn labrum does worse in two years and five-year outcomes than a repaired labrum. So that leads me to my next point. What about labral deficiency? Now, uh, we, we look at segmental loss, calcified labra, what if the patient had a failed debridement? So uh, they went in and basically took away the torn parts uh, or even attempted a repair and the repair has failed, but why has it failed? We've looked at reconstruction of an irreparable labrum and in a matched fashion found uh, very, very favorable outcomes at both two and now five year marks. Um, so this particular example in a 28 year old football player from the NFL had a prior hip arthroscopy had a failed label repair, meaning the patient continued to have hip pain. So I'll take you back to that gross specimen second video where the labral seal was, was lost and that hip was not articulating well. The patient had symptoms. So in our hands, this demands a circumferential label reconstruction uh, from TAL to TAL. We do this again, uh, minimally invasively, arthroscopically. We use a, a, a cadaver allograft uh, brought in from the posterior aspect of the hip and, and it's brought down along the entirety of the acetabulum. And again, the goal is to provide the suction seal to the hip so that it ma maintains contact with the femoral head. And so uh, you can see the tacking down of the labrum uh, from medial uh, to lateral, anterior to posterior. This is the reconstructed labrum in its entirety. And when traction is let off the hip, you can see that femoral head is now in contact with a brand new labrum. So, we published on this and label reconstruction, even in a primary setting in patients with chondral defects has been shown to decrease the risk of conversion to total hip arthroplasty. So again, if you keep that pyramid in your mind, we're trying to prevent us from getting to the top of that pyramid necessitating a THR. Everything below that is in preservation mode. And I believe hip arthroscopy has been proven without, with numerous uh, literature reports as to why it can, can be beneficial. Um, we've also looked at this now at the five-year mark, and we've had significant improvement in patient-reported outcomes uh, when comparing the recon group versus a benchmark repair group. So even compared to repair cohort, patients that went underwent reconstructions uh, have favorable outcomes at the five-year mark. So results have been described as durable. Um, now, I, that's the intraarticular soft tissue management, and, and I want to look step one, one step back and go into the, the bony architecture here. So the static stabilizers of the hip, if you have overgrowth of the bone on the cam, uh, on the femoral side called a cam or on the acetabular side called a pincer, it should sort of make sense that if you remove those bony landmarks, the patient should theoretically have a repaired labrum that stays repaired. Well, the art of the surgery is doing this safely. And what do I mean by that? Um, it sort of comes down to the question, why are there so few surgeons in the country who specialize in hip arthroscopy? Because of this picture here. So imagine a 40 year old police officer who presented to us obviously you must be able to, be, to, to run to do his job, had an errant femoroplasty. And so we sort of call this an apple bite lesion or, or a scalloped shark bite lesion of the femoral head. You cannot put that bone back. You could have a great label repair, you can have a great label reconstruction, but if the bone is missing, there's nothing you can do about that. And the patient uh, eventually went on to undergo a total hip replacement um, and did great. Uh, of course, pain is relieved, but at 40 years of age, likely to have a secondary or even a, a third uh, revision replacement in his, his lifetime. 
Uh, again, this is a video of that you saw previously, but of the femoral head coming out in an MIS fashion. Again, patient is the same day procedure, but uh, will potentially need a second or a third hip replacement uh, given his level of activity. So let's get into sort of a little bit of the details as to why unloading the hip uh, is helpful, but doing this in a, in a, in a con concerted fashion uh, with uh, the proper techniques. So we've published on the search of a spherical thermoplasty, meaning that over-resection has actually found to be to, to lead to inferior outcomes uh, before and after revision hip arthroscopy when compared to neutral or even under-resected femoral heads. And so we went one step further and to help teach uh, sort of the masses on, on this technique, recently published a technique article on this on how to do it safely. And so using intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy uh, in graduated fashions with, with very scripted and, and uh, uh, particular uh, movements of the hip, we can achieve a perfectly spherical thermoplasty every single time. Um, this is the ideal sort of picture we want to have. We want to have a dynamic impingement test with no bony contact of the rim and the femoral head, but we want to have perfect sealing of that repaired labrum throughout the entirety of range of motion. So I've proven to you that hip arthroscopy via, via literature, and not just ours, I mean, there, there's hundreds of articles that show that it's a benefit to patients. But now let's talk about the particular candidate um, that would be most beneficial um, when utilizing a thing like an unloader hip to help relieve pain. And so I'll sort of give you a hint. Um, it's the term is going to be hip microinstability. And you may or may not say to yourself, um, wait a second, I thought the hip was inherently a stable joint because of the large uh, sort of uh, dynamic structures. It's a weight bearing joint um, and, and it's got more coverage than a, a shoulder does. Well, it's, it's very particular and we'll go through the details here. Um, the iliofemoral ligament, which surrounds the hip joint is the strongest in the body, uh, tensile strengths of over 700 pounds. Um, but when you look at laxity, uh, let's look at the shoulder versus the hip. The shoulder in the left on this professional football player is traumatic, it's acquired, it's a dynamic issue. Um, this dislocation occurred in a moment in time. Look at the patient on the top right. She is uh, intentionally dislocating her hip to get her super physiological motion uh, during her ballet activity. This is congenital, this is static, this is something that is that she was born with. So this is considered generalized ligamentous laxity. I'm sure the folks on this phone call uh, may or may not have had patients like this in their careers, uh, but, but likely so, given the amount of literature that's been put out on, on sort of chronic microinstability of large uh, joints. So I'm gonna talk about hip microinstability causing things like a labral tear but it's, it's, it's via two different pathways. Uh, the first pathway is the video you just saw. So if someone has generalized ligamentous laxity, we test this with what's called a Baten score. Um, we test on all of our patients. It's a nine point scale that tests the inherent uh, flexibility within the patient's genetics. Um, the other is under coverage. So imagine a socket of the hip that is not covering the femoral head. The femoral head is trying to escape because of the lack of coverage. So both of these particular situations can lead to hip microinstability, which can then therefore cause labral tears and pain, and they all manifest as pain. So it's our job as clinicians to figure out what is causing the patient's pain, but more, patient's pain, but more importantly, the specifics of the pathology. So the Baten score we, pub we published on previously, um, it's used to detect uh, GLL as a cause of instability. So the first category that I presented to you, um, we've looked at recently a cohort of 1,381 patients within our patient population. And we, this was not an outcome study. We simply wanted to look at the demographic distribution, the presentation of the patients in the office, as well as the, the history and physical. Um, and then we wanted to look at intraoperative findings and procedures that were performed for these patients. So we found that patients that had a Baten score of four or greater were more likely to be younger, have a lower BMI and be female. They had on, uh, as, as one would think, increased range of motion, um, and uh, we found out smaller label size and tear dimension. Uh, importantly, they were more likely to undergo label repair and more likely to undergo capsular plication. So just simply to repair a labrum in someone like this does not do the labrum any justice. It's, it, we have not changed the overall architecture of the, the dynamic pathology that caused the patient to have a, a labral tear. This was not due to a cam lesion. This was due to the hip moving around too much because of the generalized ligamentous laxity. So we need to do something to help tighten up that hip capsule. And so 
what do we do? We actually perform a capsular plication with an inferior shift. And so what do I mean by that? Well, we want to take that inferior medial capsular leaflet and bring it superior laterally with the way we place our sutures in an oblique fashion. You can see how they're superior lateral to inferior medial. So when the knots are tied, we have effectively brought up and imbricated that hip capsule and shifted it uh, to a superior lateral direction, thereby tightening the hip in external rotation. Um, so here's a short video just showing that where you can see working medially in the hip in an arthroscopic fashion, we have brought the, the inferior leaflet and medially to the superior lateral direction with that not being tied. And so this patient's gonna have different dynamics inside their hip joint. They're gonna complain a little bit of lack of external rotation, but remember, we're looking to preserve their hip, to restore the seal, to prevent them from having recurrent labral tears. So it's important you have a thorough discussion with your patients uh, preoperatively. So of course, we need to publish on this, and so we have. We looked at this particular type of patients uh, with borderline hip dysplasia, meaning uh, under coverage of their sockets, and they had uh, labral tears. And we looked at two-year outcomes and we had favorable PROs at two-year mark. We then looked one step further. Recently in 2018, we looked at who fails, what patients uh, did not do well from this, what were the risk factors for failure? And so both in American Journal of Sports Medicine, but most recently, we identified that the age over 35 was a 2.25 uh, more likelihood of, of failing from this type of procedure, not achieving the patient acceptable symptomatic state, which is important because I'm gonna bring back this pyramid here. So although hip arthroscopy has proven to be helpful, if you reach them too late, then they're moving up to the top of that pyramid and uh, sort of can get, provide them with a gold standard uh, hip pain reliever, but it's really our job as clinicians to catch them before they get to that point. And so I'm gonna now get into the hip preservation world. Um, so of these two x-rays, um, who would be a candidate for the unloader hip brace? And I'm gonna sort of, sort of draw out some lines here, which will help make this a little bit more clear. Let's focus on the right hip joint uh, of both respective patients here. So look at the coverage of the acetabulum, and you can then look at the contralateral hip as a reference. Um, the, the patient on the left, uh, the x-ray on the left, has a neutral uh, sort of coverage angle, um, whereas, or less than 10, I should say, that's the number we're looking for. Whereas the patient on the, uh, the, on the right has a tonus angle or acetabular roof index of potentially greater than 10. So the hip is looking to escape in that patient. That is the patient who we wanna put an unloader brace on to contain the hip uh, in, its, in its place. And that will provide pain relief. It can provide longevity of, of, of natural uh, hip dynamics and preventing potentially even a uh, labral tear. So again, the patient on the right is the one that's better uh, indicated for this type of bracing procedure. Um, so in summary, you know, we talked about management options for hip pain, um, all non-surgical uh, at some point. And we talked about biomechanics of the hip unloader brace. We've talked about candidacy, both in the arthritic realm as well as the preservation realm. We've talked about ongoing research throughout the talk here. Um, a recent RCT uh, showed looking at 45 patients with specifically OA. Um, they were placed in, in a randomized fashion with uh, half receiving the, the unloader brace and half receiving a non-functional placebo brace. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, patients that received the appropriate uh, brace treatment had uh, improved HOOST ADL scores from baseline to four weeks. They did better uh, compared to the placebo group. Now, this is short, short outcomes at four, four week interval. Uh, but this is the type of thing that's, that should spawn future research. And so at AHI, um, we are looking at a novel unloading hip orthosis, meaning the unloader brace for the arthritic hip. We wanna look at prospective analysis of the kinematic effects and the pa patient reported outcomes at minimum one year follow-up. So we wanna take the next step here. And I think that's where um, this type of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction really carries us because it stimulates discussions, it stimulates uh, thought-provoking uh, questions and, and potential answers in the future. Um, so again, the goals of managing hip pain is really understanding the pathology being treated. You have to get a thorough history. You have to do a, a very thorough physical exam uh, from baseline. Um, and really, the imaging is, is, is demand of critical evaluation uh, because not everyone has the same particular pathology. Uh, it's really based off of what they are showing you on imaging. So diagnosis is critical. Um, and really, you know, we've heard the term from Plato that eyes, you know, only see what the mind knows. And, and I truly believe that, that the, the fresh eyes uh, see new things. Um, you know, I, I, I view the world now through, through my son's eyes and 
and, and it's really phenomenal to, to watch him interact with everyday surroundings. And I just, you know, being home at this, uh, this moment in time with, with the COVID restrictions has really allowed me an opportunity to watch him grow. And I think that, uh, it's going to help me understand, you know, what he's interested in, you know, even 20, 30 years from now, this, these few short weeks that I've gotten to spend so much time with him. So, you know, it's, it's a blessing uh, in, in disguise here. And I, I really do uh, believe that to be true. So, again, thank you all for your time and, and consideration and as well as uh, uh, your attention. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lal. Great presentation. And uh, please post your questions in the chat area. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Brett Carter, who was our director of um, medical marketing, to comment a little more about the brace. There already is a question in the chat about the cost of the brace. I'm sure there are questions about how do you get access to it, et cetera. But I think Brett can provide a little more information about that. Brett? Sure. Uh, thanks, March. Uh, Dr. Law, thank you. That was a fantastic uh, talk. Um, I think what's important to, to think about here is exactly what you were talking about is the proper diagnosis and, and looking to where this where this can help certain patients and then patient selection is, is going to be key. Um, one of the things that I like in, in describing this, and, and Dr. Law did a great job in, in comparing to the knee and then to the hip, um, is it's one where what we're really trying to achieve with this micro motion that Dr. Law was talking about is prevention of misalignment. If we can keep the, the head of the femur in the acetabulum where it's supposed to be away from those sensitive spots that have deteriorated from internal, excessive internal rotation, excessive adduction. Um, if we can keep them abducted, prevent that internal rotation or externally rotate them as appropriate, we can distribute the load in a more anatomically correct position. And we achieve this, as, as Dr. Lyle said, in a non-weight bearing form. So your patients who have trouble sleeping at night because of the pain, they may only need to use this product at night to help them sleep. So if you get a more a, a better night's sleep, you're more productive the next day, you may not have to necessarily wear uh, a, a product such as an unloader hip during the day because that's not when you're experiencing experience your pain. And how we're able to achieve that is preventing that excessive internal rotation and adduction of the hip, creating that pressure point or the concentration of the force over an area that's been compromised either with the labrum or, or the cartilage. It's um, a little bit more difficult to describe over the, uh, the, the internet. This is one that you kind of have to see to, to appreciate it. But what we're trying to do is integrate the brace into a soft form, a yoga shorts or biker pants, if you will, with combining like an SI or an LSO belt where you have a lot of compression, graduated compression, and then also control rotation of the femur. And so that's how we're able to accomplish this prevention of misalignment. Um, we have the, the macro where we grab the whole hip complex, the right and the left side of the hip with a, with a um, macro uh, layer, if you will, where we can grab the whole complex and, and provide compression. And then what I describe as micro compression is the, there are pulleys much like an uh, LSO, a traditional LSO, where we have the ability for the patient, some like a, the, the proximal aspect to be a little tighter than the distal aspect or vice versa. We have both where they distally, they want a lot of compression, but proximally, they don't want it digging in. And so you have the ability to vary. It's very patient specific, but that gives them a real nice micro compression without having to use a ton of force to achieve that compression. And then in doing that with grabbing the whole hip complex, we're keeping the head of the acetab or the head of the femur locked into the acetabulum, providing about two, two and a half degrees of abduction uh, to achieve that. And then the femur, the way it is shaped and such, it, it's easier for us to control internal rotation. We, we often speak about external rotation, but really what we're doing is preventing that internal rotation. So we can keep the leg, if we preload it in a, in a position, and how the easiest way for me to describe this is, is to have the patient point your toe to three o'clock or point your, your toe to two o'clock, and then we tighten the strap up. And now in swing phase, that strap is nice and tight. It won't allow 
the leg to internally rotate past one o'clock or get past 12 o'clock or neutral. And you can adjust that as you see fit, as Dr. Law said, as appropriate that external rotation. Um, but it, it's it's been a, a nice product for patients who are in a lot of pain. So um, somebody who presents in your clinic and they may not have all the bony uh, indications for surgery, that the, the cam or pincher lesion isn't, the bony deformations aren't enough. They potentially have a labral tear, the highly symptomatic, they, they come to you with pain. This could be an appropriate treatment in conjunction with your other treatments as well. If there's no metal in this product. There's no range of motion restriction. We want active um, dynamic stabilizers. So we want them to strengthen all their, their, their muscles as well. We just are trying to prevent that misalignment that is the root cause of the pain mechanism. And, and so in that patient who doesn't have all the, the bony morphology that you would need for surgery, we may be able to treat without uh, having to go to surgery or maybe treat that patient and address the pain while their bony conditions are so minimal that you won't be able to get authorizations for doing the, the surgery. Um, another situation could be somebody who is um, contraindicated for replacement because of, of their side or, or core morbidities. And the, the brace would help to get that patient potentially in a better position to where they may qualify for uh, a hip replacement because they can reduce some of the comorbidities or maybe reduce the, the pain medication that they need to take uh, day and night to stay at, at, at a tolerable level of pain. And if we can reduce those meds when you go in for the surgery, whether it be arthroplasty or, or arthroscopic, either way, that the patient going in is going to be a better surgical candidate just because they're less reliant on those, those pain meds or the, the comorbidities are, are diminished a bit. Brett, thank you. There, any, Brett, thank you. Yeah, there were two other questions, questions related. Um, one, uh, the cost and the related question, is it covered by insurance? Sure. So the the cost to the uh, the supplier is about eight hundred dollars. Um, the L code that uh, this qualifies for is L sixteen ninety. The average reimbursement uh, nationwide is about two thousand. I think the floor is sixteen hundred, and the ceiling in some states is twenty two hundred. But it, it's about eighteen hundred to two thousand dollar reimbursement. That's what the government and the third party payers uh, will, will pay for the brace based on your, um, your contracts with, with your, your payers. But it is, it is covered by, by the L code. Uh, doctor, thanks, Brett. Dr. Lal, a question for you. Is the efficacy of the brace affected by the degree of OA? Is it best suited for FAI patients? Uh, with GLL or and mild OA, um, I know patient selection is really the key to a lot of these treatments. And so, um, your comment on that? Yeah, sure. So I think it's multifactorial. I mean, if you've got someone who is is debilitated and cannot walk, is wheelchair bound, obviously that's not the candidate. Um, they need they need surgery um, right away. Um, I point I point out the two different types of OA patients in this presentation, one being the superior lateralized hip and one being that adducted hip that, that would less likely be a candidate because they have an effective leg leg discrepancy due to the abduction contracture because of the deformity of the hip. So really, you know, diagnosing um, uh, indications, uh, diagnosing hip pain then and then kind of leading toward indications for the, the brace, it really is multifactorial. Looking at the patients, their, their demands, um, their activity level, uh, their imaging. And that's why it's really, it's all encompassing because you've got to take the patient's, uh, you know, uh, uh, outlook uh, in, in, into play here. Um, if they're looking for uh, saying, look, I don't want surgery. I want to do everything in my power non-operatively. Uh, and I have plenty of patients that I'm, I, I'm treating them with, uh, whether it be biologics, uh, conservative therapies like physical therapy, bracing, and, and we can get them years, um, years, years down the road from needing a, a total hip replacement if they're not deemed a candidate for hip preservation. So I, I have a very unique practice where I see patients in both lights. Um, I see them if you're a hip preservation candidate, then, and I go through a list of, of risk factors in my head that are, that are published risk factors. So 
I have a, an algorithm that I go through. If the patient meets criteria for hip preservation and they have intraarticular damage, they will then proceed on that pathway. But I will only get to that surgical uh, date after having exhausted all conservative measures, and that includes this type of brace. Um, and then the same thing happens in the OA patient. I will exhaust all aspects of conservative measures uh, with this type of bracing system uh, before proceeding to surgery. So um, I sort of laid out the hip preservation candidacy. Um, if you've got large CAM FAI and a stiff hip, that may not be the, the type of patient that would benefit from something like this. It's going to be more of that, that GLL patient, that young, a thin female with a high B, a low BMI um, with, with super physiological motion in their hip. And they're saying, look, I need to get through the next three months of, of, of whatever you know, season I'm, I'm in. It could be soccer, uh, uh, basketball, uh, uh, gymnastics, whatever it is. Um, this is something to buy them through their season uh, and potentially uh, give them the ability to not need surgery if their symptoms do resolve. Uh, non-operatively. So it's a very multi multifactorial answer um, um, uh, that we need to look at for all patients, I think. Uh, Dr. Lala, another question. Are there any physical therapy exercise studies versus the brace? Uh, are there exercises the patient should focus on when using the brace? Uh, when you mean versus the brace, you mean are, are there any exercise studies that uh, that have been done using the brace? Is that? I think uh, that's the question, yeah. Okay. Uh, or, or, uh, Treatment A versus treatment B, et cetera. Yeah, not, yeah, not that I'm aware of yet. And that's where I think the low-hanging fruit uh, is in, in, in sort of the modern medicine is that that's, you know, the fact that OSER went, went out and did this, you went out on a limb uh, as a company to, to make a brace for a joint that really hasn't been discussed before. No one's done it before. And so now it's our job as, as, as physician scientists to put this on in a prospective manner uh, on patients uh, that have similar pathology and they're matched, meaning age, sex, BMI, to a different cohort of patients, and and see if the brace helps you. And so that's that's what that's that's my job. That, that's what what clinicians and, and colleagues that I meet with discuss on a regular basis is doing these types of studies um, in, in a prospective manner. Dr. Law, this this is Brett again. What we would suggest in that instance is this isn't a brace or exercise. It's a brace with exercise. The intention is that the brace will help prevent that misalignment that will which causes pain that will allow them to do a more effective PT regimen that would strengthen those dynamic stabilizers. So um, this isn't designed to replace or take away from any of your modalities that you have at your disposal, whether it be PT, uh, stem cells, uh, injections, what have you. It's, it's brace plus, not brace or. Um, right, and, and, I, and I, I agree with that 100%. I don't use this uh, in isolation. It's with something else. If, again, if, yeah. we're avoiding, if we're avoiding surgery, I've indicated the patient for brace plus anti-inflammatories plus potential biologic treatments. Um, uh, it's got to be something in addition to with, with physical therapy focused on uh, relieving uh, pain generators in a, in a pain-free fashion. So it's got to be, you're absolutely right, it has to be with, with other uh, adjuncts. Yeah, typical multimodal uh, treatment protocol that is most effective, right? Absolutely. Another question for you, ability to run and exercise in the brace. Any recommended sport limitations while in the brace? Yeah, no, not that I've seen. Um, I have, have a, a, a number of patients that have, have really done anything and everything they want. Um, now, if you're talking about the OA patient, it may just be simple activities of daily living that they're able to do uh, with less pain. And that's, that's all they need to do. Um, that's all they want to do. I've had patients that are athletes that are on the uh, uh, you know, uh, field or court um, uh, with a brace. Uh, now, if they have an injury that's, that's indicating them for this, clearly that pain has to go down. So they're typically in a, in a physical therapy sort of uh, regimen as opposed to uh, the same level of, 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 of uh, athletics that they were before they were injured. So they're, they're rehabbing with the brace with the intention of potentially not needing surgery, getting back to their baseline level of activity um, and potentially not needing the brace in the future, but it's, it's gotta be on them during the rehab process. So, uh, but I haven't seen any limitations uh, thus far. And we have an orthopedic surgeon uh, colleague, another KOL, that is an avid biker, and um, he wears the brace um, when he bikes. So, again, depending on the patient and, and the, um, the, the limitation and symptoms they have, it can be very appropriate while exercising. 
Certainly, we have a lot of hockey players actually who are indicated for for surgery FAI. They have uh, impingement syndrome, but they're mid season or, or prior to the season. They don't want to miss for um, uh, and do the surgery, so they will wear the unloader hip mid season in in practice and in the games. And that gets them through to when they can have the surgery in the off season. We have quite a few, uh, a very large uh, subset of patients who who fit into that with the hockey players. Definitely something to try um, on really active patients and see how they respond. Uh, another question: Do patients get a trial of using the brace to see if it's helpful for them? Y yes. Yeah, so uh, this is Brett again. Um, this is guaranteed uh, at as satisfaction to the patient or to, to you. Um, so if your patient tries this and there is no benefit, there is no pain relief, they just are not um, benefiting from the use of the product, just as if with our knees, we offer a full no questions asked guarantee. Um, the caveat to that would be, I probably wouldn't tell the patient that, I would keep that in your back pocket, knowing that if this doesn't work, if there isn't any benefit, we're not going to stick the patient or, or anybody is, is not gonna be stuck with a brace that they're not going to use. We take that back and we try something else and, and we'll encourage that. So it's guaranteed. Okay. Yeah, and we have a, a PMNR key opinion leader that actually does a brace trial. Um, and he says, often when you do, as Britt referred to that SI belt or that, that macro belt that comes around the hip, that they could feel relief then just by putting that on. But he does a stair test with the brace on, um, you know, going upstairs, coming downstairs, uh, seeing how the patient responds in office uh, before actually deciding uh, to go forward with the brace. Uh, but Dr. Lal, do you do any uh, brace test or any evaluation um, while the patient is considering it? Yeah, so um, to my previous slide about a prospective a trial that we're, we're, we're lining up. Um, so we are the first um, uh, uh, sort of all hip uh, dedicated clinic in the country. And we also have developed um, a sort of kinematic test. Uh, it's a three-dimensional biomechanical evaluation where patients uh, are placed on a mat. Um, it's sort of with tracers and we can identify uh, weaknesses of dynamic movements uh, and, and isolate to muscle groups in the extremities left and right uh, via a battery of tests uh, that they do. Uh, single leg hop, seat, sit to stand, uh, uh, just uh, range of motion analysis. And so it allows us to give a printout before and after application of the brace. And, and this, this three-dimensional analysis was really developed at our institute to identify when patients are ready to return to function. So if you had a hip arthroscopy and you're an athlete and you're trying to say, when can I go back to you know, full go. Um, previously, we said, well, it's around that four to six month range or what have you. I've had, I've had a, you know, we've had professional athletes get back much sooner because that's their job. Um, and they rehab 24 seven, seven days a week um, with the best modalities. But we really didn't have something in, in line to, to test for that. So we developed this, this three dimensional analysis. And now we're utilizing that with this particular brace, um, because we're looking at and getting uh, objective numbers as to deficiencies in the hip before application and after application. And you can see the difference, uh, statistically significant differences in patients when they uh, perform uh, during this test, uh, just, just in the same day even. Um, so we then test them after use, after weeks to months down the road as well. Great, thank you. Um, anything else? I love the discussion, you know, when we started these webinars because of the era that we're in right now, <laughs> feels like an era, right? Uh, we didn't know if we could really um, duplicate the dynamic discussion that we've had in face-to-face -face meetings, but with all of your help we have, and, um, and, and thank you so much for all your participation. Any, any last minute questions? Um, okay, there are a couple questions, Dr. Lal, that would say reply in private if you're seeing on that. So there may be something that um, you can see the chat to uh, your right, and I'm gonna respect that and not uh, read the question. Or I can read the question, but then have you reply in private. How does that work? Uh, roll, sure. of, roll, roll of prolonged brace in hypoplastic labrum in symptomatic 
pain and apprehension following FAI, FAI following FAI surgery. And they're requesting a reply in private on the second to you role of the brace in hyperlax female athlete in general post FAI surgery. So should I not reply? <laughs> um, um, uh, I think no, you can. It's it's uh, the way they sent the chat in. Oh, uh, sorry. Thank you, okay. expert. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank yeah, you. Was, well, reply can be public. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead and reply. Yeah, it's it's hard to remember all the questions. So uh, the first question was a uh, uh, a hypoplastic labrum post FAI surgery. If if I'm not mistaken, is that uh, correct? Yeah, let me get back to that. Yes, role of prolonged brace in hypoplastic labrum and symptomatic pain and apprehension following FAI surgery. Yeah, so that goes back to the NFL player example that I provided. Um, that patient had a hypoplastic labrum. It was not amenable to a repair. It had attempted to be repaired but it still lost the seal. And that's why you sort of have a similar patient in your hands, whoever uh, uh, listed the question. The patient had a prior hip arthroscopy. There likely was an attempt at a repair or a potential segmental debridement. Um, and now a post-operative MRI is showing that the labrum is hypoplastic. It's very small and diminutive. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you, you, can, you can sort of look at the patient uh, as a whole and say, what are they looking for? What's the age? What's the activity level? Are they saying that, are they a young patient with healthy appearing cartilage, known hypoplastic labrum and a failed hip preservation moment? In, in my hands, you know, truthfully, in that kind of patient, I'm, I'm looking after their hip 50 years from now. And if, if in my hands, if I can prevent them from undergoing rapid degeneration of their intraarticular cartilage, I'm going to do that. I'm going to perform a label reconstruction and reconstitute that seal that I showed you in that video because that's what they need right now. Um, now, it, that doesn't mean that the patient cannot bridge the gap with a brace like this, but I think your question was specifically to prolonged use. And so if the patient is not amenable to surgery, they cannot have surgery for whatever reason, um, it's not the time, right time of, of their life or, or there's other, other factors that are involved, then yes, I think this is the appropriate brace to, to put on that patient because Otherwise, they're going to continue to have that symptomatic uh, range of motion uh, throughout their activities of daily living, and that's not fair. Um, so this is definitely a brace that I would use in that category. And then Margie, what was the uh, second question? Yeah, second question, role of the brace in hyperlax female athlete in general post FAI surgery. Right. So uh, again, back to my GLL examples that I provided, that is the, the, and the potentially under coverage of the acetabulum. That is the patient that, that, that I would prefer to put the brace on. Um, now, if you're saying the patient has had FAI surgery, I hope that the uh, astute surgeon that performed it also performed some type of capsular management because they have hyperlaxity syndrome. So they need to have uh, capsular plication, some sort of management to augment the biomechanics of that particular hip. Uh, using a brace in that setting postoperatively, if, if, if the pain is doing, patient's doing well with it, then 100% yes. And I've done that. I have a, a, a Division One basketball player, um, a female patient who presented to me uh, postoperatively from, a, from an outside facility, but is not wishing to have surgery uh, going into her senior season. And now with COVID, it's obviously a different situation, but um, uh, going into the senior season was was saying, I do not want to have surgery. And so I, I don't I don't blame them one bit. And that's the patient I put the brace on because I want them to play and practice in this to prevent uh, further damage to a hip um, that may be uh, not having any symptoms when they're not playing basketball. So if they get through their one season, they may not need a revision surgery or any type of surgery in the future. They may do well. So I think, yes, that also the answer is yes to that question um, uh, if needed. Dr. Law, what is your post-op protocol to labral reconstruction? Uh, so it's very, very similar to label repair. Um, the major difference uh, being the weight bearing restrictions uh, for repair versus reconstruction. Um, we use a cadaveric allograft um, for our reconstruction graft. We used to use hamstring autograft, semitendinosis, uh, but there's a, a fair amount of morbidity associated with that. And we, we did a prospective study on uh, autograft versus allograft and found no differences. Uh, we found no increased risk of complications. Um, we found uh, patients did well with no morbidity. Uh, again, it's a cadaveric allograft. Um, so with that being said, uh, we do uh, six weeks of, of a toe touch, 20 pounds, uh, I'm sorry, 20 pounds flat foot weight bearing to protect the graft 
incorporation uh, because remember this is cadaveric material that needs to heal into the acetabulum so that's the only major difference uh, it's two weeks versus six weeks for the protected weight bearing but other than that uh, patients are in the physical therapy center post-op day one no matter what surgery they had um, and they're being seen two to three times weekly uh, to, to continue through all phases of our protocol uh, until it's completed do you have any range of motion restrictions or is it just a bearing of weight yeah, so we have immediate post-op uh, restrictions of no no flexion past 90 degrees. Again, if they've had FAI work done, uh, we don't want to stress the repair or reconstruction. Uh, so for the repair group, it's two weeks, and for the reconstruction group, it's six weeks. So that's another uh, small difference uh, between the two. But again, it's it's to protect uh, and decrease strain on the, the structure that was treated. Um, and in addition, we don't want to strain um, the the capsule capsular tissue. So if patient underwent capsular plication, or they have borderline uh, dysplastic precautions, we want to limit um, uh, uh, passive uh, external rotation and extension uh, because we want that capsule to remain uh, intact and actually be tightened up uh, and healed and scarred in prior to returning to full range of motion. Thank you. I uh, see another question. Um, have you had any patients post-op labrum repair recovering at home receiving telehealth only? We have a patient right now recovering this way and it's going well. Yes, uh, we, we, we actually um, have a significant number. Um, so uh, Ben and I are, are very fortunate um, in the location geographically that we're in. Uh, we're in sort of the uh, crossroads of Chicago land, but we also uh, try licensed in in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. So um, we um, have been performing urgent uh, uh, surgeries um, uh, uh, relatively rarely in the past few weeks, um, but in the few patients that we had, for instance, I had a, a femoral neck stress fracture in a runner um, who had a concomitant labral tear. So um, that was an urgent case. And uh, um, I did a uh, arthroscopic labral repair and capsular plication, femoroplasty, and acetabuloplasty, as well as uh, pinning and in situ pinning of the femoral neck fracture. Um, so uh, that patient needed telehealth and um, uh, they're, they're doing it uh, very well. We, have, we actually offer telehealth from our facility. Um, we have in-house physical therapists that do evaluations uh, for patients around the country and they maintain um, activity with them two to three times a week uh, virtually. Thank you, that's great. Well, we're over our time, which is um, a success of a, of a great lecture and a great discussion when, we, um, when, we've, when we've used more time than we thought we would. Um, so thank you all, and um, we look forward to additional webinars uh, from OSER Americas with great key opinion leaders like Dr. Lal. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest, and I know you will be in touch with all of you in the future um, via follow-up emails. So thank you, and everybody have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Lal. No problem. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.